Well, hello everybody and welcome to this week's live event and we are going to be taking you on a journey through Machu Picchu. My name is Cassandra Trezise and I'm from the business development team here at Inspiring Vacations. It is my absolute honour to be your host again this week. And we have a very, very special guest, one of our gorgeous product managers and all round great guy. <laughs> Welcome, Martin. Hi, Martin. Hi, Kat. Hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. What a pleasure to be here and to show you this beautiful part of the world. I am just so truly excited. I have never been to Machu Picchu or Peru for that matter. So this is going to be an amazing journey. And Martin is absolutely the guy to take this, take us on this virtual journey here today because Martin has taken many guests through Machu Picchu as well as some other regions within South America. So he knows all the details and this is just going to be absolutely spectacular i know you're going to have questions we're all going to have questions so please as long as time is available at the end of this presentation martin will be delighted to answer all of your questions just make a comment uh, below at any stage and we'll come back and go through all of those in the end so let's get this map ready and let's get started. Martin, you are on and ready to go. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Cass. And again, welcome everyone to this presentation. In the next 15 to 15 minutes, I will take you on a Google Earth virtual tour of one of the Inca's masterpieces, Machu Picchu. Now, of course, Machu Picchu is located in Peru. Uh, and Peru is one of the most visited countries in, in South America. And initially, you might want to go there just to see Machu Picchu. But um, I'm pretty confident that at, at the end of your tour uh, of Peru, you will actually find a lot more highlights than, uh, than, than just Machu Picchu. So I, I implore you, if you haven't yet, to make your way to Peru. Hold on to your seats. We're going right into the Andes uh, region of Peru. One, two, three, you ready? Here we go. Here we go. This is exciting. <laughs> okay, here we are in the mountain region of Peru. And before we delve into Machu Picchu, I want to point out a few a few um a few towns and a few destinations. And I'll throw in a few dates. I won't bombard you with dates, but I want to give you a few just to give you an idea and just, just give you some perspective. Here in the south, you can see the town of Cusco. I've just highlighted it now. Cusco is a very important town now, very visited uh, town now. No trip to Peru is completed without Cusco, and you will go via Cusco to make your, wealth, your, your way to Machu Picchu. It's important today, but it was even more important back in the Inca state. Cusco was the, the, um, the capital city of the Inca empire. Cusco in Quechua, the language of the Incas, means belly button. So Cusco was the belly button of the empire. And from there, they expand the north, south, east and, east and west. Now, again, not many dates I'll throw you away, but let me tell you that in the 11th and 1200s uh, AC, the, the Incas moved into this Cusco region. And they lived pretty happily there, working the land, being themselves, yada, yada, yada. <laughs> it, wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't until the 1435 when the great Pachacutec Inca came to power, and under his regime, really the, the, the flourishing of the, of the Inca empire took place. It was Pachacutec himself, on the, around the 1430s, that ordered the construction of Machu Picchu. Why? Well, nowadays we believe that uh, he just wanted to build a, a royal state, a, a, royal, a royal retreat, a holiday house. I mean, if you're an Inca and if you're if you're an Inca emperor, why would you build a, a holiday house when you can build your own citadel? So he ordered the construction of uh, of Machu Picchu. Machu Picchu is here on this little spot up in the north. It's called um, uh, where you where you can read Aguas Calientes. It's only eighty kilometers north. Building Machu Picchu took about. 30 years which is quite impressive i mean they built that thing in 30 years and um, i've been living in my house for 10 years and i haven't got around build them um, uh, laying the, the the crushed granite in my backyard so they built the whole thing in 30 years keep that in mind the next town i want to point out is Ollantaytambo, a beautiful town as well amazing archaeological site 
I won't, uh, I won't talk too much about it, but you will get too much to Ollantay Tambo. And from Ollantay Tambo, you will either take a train all the way to Aguas Calientes for about two, two and a half hours, or walk for four days, the classic Inca Trail, all the way to, um, to Machu Picchu. All right, let's take a closer look. We're getting a little bit closer to Machu Picchu itself. All right, I've got this view here. I mentioned before, uh, 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 okay, sorry, let me drag you back. I mentioned before that you could take the train to uh, to visit Machu Picchu. If you take the train, you will land in this town called Aguas Calientes. From here, you take a bus, a 30 minute bus ride all the way up, wind on this winding road all the way up to, um, to Machu Picchu. If you are the active type and you decided to walk, you will land, um, you, your first view of Machu Picchu will be the, in, the, the Intipunco here, the Puerta del Sol. This is one of the most emblematic views of, uh, of Machu Picchu. Let me show you a photo of it. Oh, um, yes, very famous, that, isn't it? That's, that's right. That's a famous view. Now, whether you've taken the train and then the bus up to Machu Picchu, or whether you hike the Four Day Inca Trail, you can always, time permitting, you can always hike back to this point and enjoy this view um, of Machu Picchu. Let me take you back to the presentation. Let's get a little bit closer to Machu Picchu itself. Here we go. On this view, I wanted to show you the different sectors within Machu Picchu. The first sector is the one here that I'm, I'm pointing I'm pointing at now. It's the agricultural sector of Machu Picchu. Then we've got the residential section of Machu Picchu. And then we've got the more important, the, the main palaces in, in Machu Picchu. I'm going to take you on a tour, starting on the agricultural section, going through the urban section, finishing at the temples there at the back. Mm -hmm. Okay, how big is that space yeah. do you think, Martin? How big Sorry? would that be? How, how much space does all of those areas of the citadel take up? Oh, it's, 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 it's huge. I don't know the square meters um, um, by heart, what? but it's, it, it's huge. You, you will see now. Oh, are you ready? Oh, I love this Google Earth thing. It's fantastic. Welcome to Machu Picchu. Let's take a moment to uh, take a look around. Beautiful setting, this incredible archaeological site, magnificent Andes on the back. Nothing really prepares you for the first time that you are standing in front of Machu Picchu. You will see millions of photos, you will see lots of presentations before you get there, but once you are there, it's absolutely amazing. It's an incredible experience. Now, I wanted to land, um, to land here to explain a couple of things about Machu Picchu. What you see there at the back is the House of the Guardians. Now, architectonically, not very important, not very impressive. It's just very simple constructions. They were um, meant to be for the, for the gardens. These are, this is one of the main entrances to Machu Picchu. So the gardens would just live there and, and keep an eye on, on the valley below and Machu Picchu. Um, the next thing I wanted to show you in this and this image is a terracing work that the Incas did here in Machu Picchu and throughout Peru. You will see terraces like this throughout Peru. These terraces have a dual purpose. The first purpose and the most important one, particularly on, in Machu Picchu, is to retain the soil and to stop erosion. Machu Picchu is in a cloud forest. We get up to 2,000 millimeters of rain per year. So if they didn't um, build this um, uh, terraces system, a landslide would simply take the entire citadel down to the bottom of a valley in, in no time. So the Incas started building Machu Picchu from the bottom up. They started building these platforms first, these terraces first, and then they went on to build um, to build the, 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 the buildings and the structures on, on top of it. And these platforms are impressive enough from outside. I mean, what you see there, it's like, wow, look at those retention walls. But it's not until you dig into those terraces that you really get a, a better understanding of the magnitude of the work the Incas did uh, in, in this mountain. Each of these terraces has a layer of uh, fertile soil on the top. Underneath, there's a layer of sand. And underneath, there's a thicker layer of rocks and gravel. That allows the rain to fall onto the, the terraces and to drain right down to the core of the mountain. And from there, the water will be distributed out by, by a series of channels and aqueducts. 
It's believed that as much as 60% of the work of Machu Picchu was actually done underground. And what we see, the buildings and everything on top, is just 40% of, of Machu Picchu itself. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. Now, um, we've got a lot of walking and a lot of exploring to do, so let's keep going to the next slide. Oh, hello, Yama. It's the Lama or a Yama. The Lamas, Vicuñas, and alpacas are three types of camelids that live in the Andes. They were extensively used by the Incas for the wool, for the um, for the meat, and uh, for transport as well. Nowadays, you will see them all around Machu Picchu. They are merely uh, lawn mowers, really. They just make sure that the, 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 the lawn is kept nice and short, almost, almost to Australian standards. Well, they're doing a very good job by the looks <laughs> of it. <laughs> they're amazing, very photogenic. Now, Peru is in a very seismic area. Uh, a lot of earthquakes have flattened modern cities in Peru and in South America uh, in, in the past. But Machu Picchu and the buildings here are still standing. And this is thanks to one of the techniques that the Incas used to build the, the buildings. They were absolutely 100% aware of earthquakes and what it meant and how they needed to build the, the, the constructions. And you can see it, you can see it on this presentation here. If you look at my um, at my cursor, you can see the the slight indented, indent incline, inclination of the buildings. Yeah, they're all slightly leaning inwards. You can see it on these platforms, and if I span around, you can also see it on this wall. Hopefully, you can see it better on this wall. Slightly, um, in, um, not completely indent. straight, slightly. Yeah, I can see that. That's exactly amazing. Right. Yeah, and, and that meant that the structures were leaning against each other and that in case of an earthquake, they move and they support the way the way of each other. That, together with the thickness of the walls, if you look at one of these windows, you can see the thickness of these walls. And this is a pretty ordinary wall. There's nothing special about it. It's not a very sacred place, but um, they still look at the work that they put behind building just this, this wall. All right, next. Dun, dun, dun. Where are we? Okay, yes, all right, very important. Look, before they, they started building, before they even started building Machu Picchu, they had to take a few, um, they had to plan a few, a few elements. One of them was the availability of water, constant um, water, cl uh, clean, drinkable water throughout the year. And yes, we are in a cloud forest and there's a lot of water coming from, uh, coming from the sky in form of rain, but that's not enough. The whole hydraulic system that the Incas used to uh, to distribute water around Machu Picchu is incredible, and you can spend hours just talking about that. But um, just briefly, let me say that 800 meters north of Machu Picchu, there is a there is a system of um, spring water. The Incas took the water from that spring system, they channeled it on a on a on a channel made by by rock, which still stands and it still functions even today, 500 years later, and they take the water into the citadel. Once inside the citadel they transport the water throughout the entire citadel on a system of channels and fountains like the ones you see here there are 14 fountains scattered around around Machu Picchu so a very very ingenious way to supply drinkable um, uh, drinkable water to the whole um, Machu Picchu next slide is home just a rock let me turn around what do we got here oh, yes. <laughs> that's good better rock, that's that was good <laughs> That's better. That is um that is this is the temple of the condor. The condor, if you haven't been to South America, if you haven't been to Peru, the condor is a huge bird that lives in the Andes in South America. And it was a very important bird for the Incas. The Incas believed in three worlds: the underworld, the world of the dead, which is represented by a snake, the world of the living, the current world, which is represented by a puma, and the upper world, the world of the gods, which is represented by surprise, surprise the condor that's right so yeah. this temple was dedicated to the condor to the upper gods what you see here is the head this stone here is the head of the condor this is the peak and this is a white color a very distinctive white color than the that the male condor has mm -hmm. if we can move a little bit to the right it's a, it's a fair bit of people here excuse me we're coming through more <laughs> hey, oh, hey, we touch my bum <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Sorry, quarantine is driving me crazy. Um, all right, so this is 
three-dimensional um, temple. This is the head once again of a, of, a, of a condor. And here you can see what represented the wings, the wings of a condor. Behind this temple, there's a jail system. So there was a number of um, um, uh, cages and it's a maze of dungeons where the prisoners were kept story tells for up to three days before the faith was decided. Now, what could lay you in jail back on those days? Stealing, surprise, surprise, and um, laziness, laziness. If you were lazy, boom, off you go to jail in, a, in an empire that achieved so much in such a little time, laziness was, was not, not allowed, it's simply not an option. Um, but there you go, Temple of the Condor. Let me take you to the next temple. Mm. Where are we? Boom. Okay. Temple of the Sun. I mentioned before that they um, they took careful consideration of the water situation before they built Machu Picchu. Now the the, the Incas were incredible astronomers. They um they had a really good understanding of the sun and they based this the solar calendar um uh, or the agricultural system sorry was based around the solar calendar. This is the Temple of the Sun, the main Inca god. The, what you see here is a, is a rock, and, and, uh, and on top of that, that rock was turned into a, a table, a sacrifice table. Now, why is this important? On the 21st of June each year, the sun rises from the top of the mountains and shines right through this trapezoidal window straight onto this stone. That marked the solstice to the Incas. Yes, that's the, that's the shortest day of the year. It's a very important event. There would have been huge ceremonies um, back at the time. And even today, the, the 21st of June, the Inti Raimi, it's, uh, it's still celebrated in Cusco and worthwhile if you, can, if you can pay the visit. So again, a very important temple, the Temple of the Sun. Let's go to the next slide. Where are we? Okay, we are precisely underneath the Temple of the Sun. If we look up, I hope I'm not making you dizzy with this, but if you look up, that is that trapezoidal window that we were looking at before. So right underneath it is one of the um, structures that I, I, I like the most. This is, um, this is the, 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 the royal tomb, the royal tomb. This is a mausoleum where they would have come to um, put to rest the bodies of the nobles, Inca nobles, the highest priest, or even the Inca himself. Um, again, let me see if I can uh, move, uh, squeeze in a little bit and see if we can take a better look inside. Okay, yes, that's a slightly better. You can there see inside this mausoleum, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful work. Uh, of, of on stone, they cut one piece of stone. Again, remember that the Incas built everything that we're seeing using nothing but stones. They had no metals, they had no wheel. So everything they cut, everything they did, they did it working stone and stone and um, on a very hard stone. Yes, yeah, these are granite, granite blocks. So it's, not a, it's not a soft stone, incredible work. Um, so yeah, temple, the, 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 royal, the royal tomb. Many skeletons were, were found here, again, all um, thought to belong to the nobles of the, of the Incas. All right, bye, people. Let me go to the next slide. Moving on. Where are we? Okay, the main plaza. This is a very, very important structure here um, in Machu Picchu. If I move a couple of steps back into the plaza and I turn around, um, actually, I won't turn around now. The plaza, the, the central plaza, it's a it's a formation that divides the the residential part of Machu Picchu. So all those buildings that you see there uh, are the residential part of Machu Picchu where the workers uh, would have would have lived. And then if I span around, you will see the most sacred part of, of Machu Picchu. These are the main temples of Machu Picchu. Without being an expert archaeologist, you can quickly uh, realize whether you are whether you're watching, whether you're in front of a very important building or not. All important buildings, whether they were temples or residence of, a, of priests or, or the Incas, they were beautifully worked on stones like these, huge blocks of stones, perfectly carved, many angles, all fitting within each other, um, creating these buildings without the need of more. So there's absolutely nothing holding these rocks, but the way, um, the way of the rocks themselves. Uh, incredible perfection you can't put a piece of paper through it and this is 
This is impressive. Again, it's a beautiful wall and a beautiful temple, but I implore you to explore the city of Cusco where you will find enormous blocks, blocks weighing tons that are, again, perfectly, perfectly carved in many angles. It's absolutely stunning. So the, this is one of the most important temples. Let, let, let's take a look at this temple from above. Here we are above the temple. Now, I, I admire archaeologists. They are incredible people. They've done a lot of work. They've um, they found a lot of things about the Incas. They are very, very smart people, no doubt. But I can tell you one thing about them. They did not spend a lot of time naming this temple. They named this temple, hold on to it, the Temple <laughs> of the Three Windows. Boom, done. <laughs> My job is done. <laughs> I'm done. Who's got to drink beers? Um, so, yes. The, the temple of the three windows um very very important temple this temple in conjunction with the temple that is just behind it the main temple um where we're very important the incas or the priests would have come to these temples they would have prepared themselves they would have ready themselves they would have performed sacrifices on these temples before walking down to the main plaza and performing a ceremony for the rest of the population so very very sacred places very important places um, for for the Incas. Another view of this roofless um, um, temple. This 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 temple was like this. It was not meant to have a roof. This is these are ceremony tables here. Um, you, you see all the all the different chambers again found throughout throughout the um, throughout the different constructions with. Back in the day, they, they held ceramic pieces and bones and, and things like that. So um, yeah beautiful beautiful work of masonry so yeah these two temples are the main temples of um uh, of, uh, of machu picchu let me take you to the next slide and um, with this i'm getting almost to to the end this is this is an intihuatana it's a hitching it's a hitching post um of the sun the Incas, as I mentioned before, um, were incredible as astrologists. The, the agriculture system was based on the observation of the constellations, especially of the sun, and this rock is a testimony of this. There's a couple of um, very uh, particular events that happened throughout the year on this on this rock. Firstly, the table around the the, um, the table around the rock is got four uh, four angles, each of them pointing one to the one to north, one to the south, east and west, with, west with with perfect um, um, uh, um very very accurately thank you yes uh, <laughs> but then this little post here uh, on the two equinoxes on the 21st of march and on the 21st of september precisely at midday the sun sits precisely above this this little post and it produces no shadow at all it's only on those two days that this post produces no shadow at all again marking the two equinoxes very important events on the Inca calendar year, and there would have been ceremonies carried out here in Machu Picchu and throughout the whole the whole empire. Another very important date, and we mentioned it before, in the Temple of the Sun was um, the twenty first of June. Yeah, the, the summer solstice, the winter solstice, the shortest shortest day of the year. So the Incas would have roped a golden circle around this platform symbolizing the capture of the sun and bringing the sun closer to the earth once once again um, so amazing amazing piece of work the, the the only way this is possible i mean the only way the equinoxes produce no um shadow on this stone is because they are built on a 13 degree angle so it's an incredible incredible perfection a bit of trivia um back in 2000 a very famous beer company was filming uh, an, an ad a, a tv ad for, for, the, for the beer on this uh, on this Intihuatana, and one of the cranes fell down and it chipped one of the corners of the of the post. There's a mm -hmm. huge uproar. They, they, you know, people people in Peru want to want everyone you know, all all, uh, all people in charge of Machu Picchu to go to to go to jail. Of course, nothing happened. Someone ended up with a lot of uh, cases of beer in the in the back in the backyard. Um, but, but yeah, beautiful, beautiful building. And since then, it's really, really well protected, and you, you can get too close to it without a without a condo diving on you. <laughs> no, no, not really. But without well, a security no person, film there yeah. anyway. <laughs> Sorry? I just said there's probably no more ads being filmed there anymore. 
no, 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 no. Very, very restrictive um, nowadays. Look, let me take you um, to the last slide, really, that I have prepared to to you today. It's a, it's an overview of Machu Picchu. Um, if you if you haven't been to Machu Picchu yet, please make yourself uh, please make your way here. This this little talk is taking what 10, 10 15 minutes tops the real tour around Machu Picchu. It takes between two and a half to four hours, and it's led by an expert, not like me, an expert, someone that really knows all the ins and outs of the Inca civilization. And in those two and a half to four hours, you really get a really good, a very good understanding of what life would have been here in Machu Picchu at, at, at the time. Um, I just I just realized that when I was talking about the platforms, I didn't talk about um, the, the agricultural meaning that the platforms had. Uh, there were between 700 to 1,000 people living permanently here in Machu Picchu, and they were all there was a self-sustained um, population. They 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 they, they um, harvest and they, they, they performed agriculture on the terraces, and they would grow all the food that they that they needed. That didn't mean that they didn't bring food from different parts of the empire. The Incas were really good at that, at, trans, at, trans, at transporting food from the jungle onto the mountain regions and from the mountain regions down to down to the jungle. So um, they, they ate very well, which which was um, a great bargaining chip for the Incas as they expanded the empire. You know, they, they got to different civilizations and they went, look, come here, join us. We've got all this food. We've got this amazing empire. Look at, look at us. So a lot of smaller civilizations went, yeah, you know what? I'm sick of eating potatoes. So uh, please bring it on. Let's let's join the club. Let's join the Inca club. And um, so, so that was a great bargaining chip. But of course, if uh, if they said, ah, you know what? Potatoes and corn is fine by me. Thank you very much, Incas. Of course, the army came behind and they um, they, they helped them to convince to join the, the Inca empire. Um, Gus and everyone, that is all I have prepared for you today. Uh, I'm, uh, if, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if there are any. Yes. Oh, Martin, that was absolutely spectacular. I, Before we started, I said to Martin, I have never been to South America. It's one continent I'm yet to get to because I've never stopped to learn. But that was incredible i'm i'm so grateful and truly inspired and i'm sure there's so many people that are watching today or perhaps even watching the recording over the next couple of days that are just going to be really uh intrigued by the incas and their history and i i don't doubt that the empire was in the end uh quite happy with the summer house it, it seemed quite nice in the end yes. so yes no, yeah. Summer house as we now know it. <laughs> and look, um, this is what we looked at today. It's just, it's just ruins. It's an archaeological site. It's walls. It's, uh, you know, it's dead stones in the end. But um, to me, one of the main highlights of, of Peru is it's that the, the, the actual Inca culture is still very much alive in Peru. And you get to see it and you get to witness it and you get to interact with it really as you as you travel through Peru, as you go through the Coca Canyon, Lake Titicaca, the Sacred Valley. It's right there. People are still living like they did back in the Inca state. They're still working the land it's the same way they, they did back in the, in the Inca state. So it's still there. We can still witness it. We can still can still um, see that impressive empire yeah that is that is very cool isn't it you know the idea of being able to go up to Machu Picchu and as you say do the two to four hour tour of Machu Picchu and see the history yeah. and think about the land that you're now walking on and who walked on that land before you but then to actually go further into Peru and to all these locations that you're speaking of and see the descendants those that are still working that lifestyle and it becomes a reality that's really rare and quite yes. an extraordinary element to uniqueness even to peru yeah absolutely and in fact you really want to explore peru before you get to Machu Picchu, you want to see, you want to see, uh, if possible, Cusco. You want to see um, uh, the Coca Canyon, even Lake Titicaca, Lake Titicaca as well. Very, very important parts of the Inca Empire. Um, so that's a preamble to what you're going to see in Machu Picchu. You know, it's, uh, it gives you a very good. Um, it's great to have that background knowledge to see all the different archaeological sites to really learn on different parts of Peru. And how they lived, how they worked the land, how they how they built these amazing buildings, and um and 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 then you make your journey to Machu Picchu. So yeah, it, it's well and truly a journey, something you shouldn't rush. There's a lot of people just 
going to Lima, flying to Cusco, and, and going to Machu Picchu in three and four days. They, they are they are out. It's it's real. It's a real shame to see people visiting Machu Picchu in that way because they it really doesn't um, yeah, give it a give it give it credit to to what Machu Picchu and, and Peru is. That's awesome. What great insight. And we do have questions. So if you're okay with it, Martin, and you've got time, we'll go through the questions. Okay, great. So first question we've got are, what are the must-see things to do in Cusco? Oh, look. Okay, give us top five. Top five. Top five. <laughs> I um again Cusco was um Cusco was the 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 heart of the Inca Empire. Then the Spaniards came and they conquered the Incas. And what they did is they they took all the palaces and all the temples and and, and all the main buildings from the Incas and they transformed them into the Spanish mansions and cathedrals and churches. So today. Cusco is an amalgamation of Inca and Spanish culture like you are not going to see anywhere else in the world, anywhere else in Peru for that matter. So first highlight I would say in Cusco, get lost exploring the different streets. You are walking around the street and you you, you, you find yourself face to face to face to an incredible Inca wall. Um, so that would be my first highlight. The, um, um, uh, Cori Cancha is a, it's another temple based in, in in Cusco that is absolutely extraordinary. One of the main temples of the of the Incas in the, in the entire empire. So well worth the visit. It's magnificent, magnificent work there. Um, and then really start exploring. These days I really like Peru. I really like um, uh, Cusco. I like to going to the market, the local, the local market there, uh, it's out of this world, it's really raw, and you're going to see things that you might not be prepared to see, but it, again, it's a real insight. Well, you see, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, guinea pigs are, are a pet for us here in Australia, and I didn't know about that until I actually came here to Australia 20 years ago. I, for me, until then, they were simply food. So um, you see a lot of, they, they eat a lot of guinea pigs um, there, the Incas ate them as well. And so you see a lot of um, guinea pigs hanging there, um, just oops, I guess. <laughs> Um, so yeah, amazing, amazing market. Great to get just get get lost there. The main square, the main square of Cusco, that would be my fourth one. It's a place where you want to sit down and take a couple of hours just to look around and take it take it all in. It's a beautiful, beautiful structure with a cathedral in one end, one end, the the um the church and in, in, in another end. And then the fifth, really, um, if you're going to go to Peru, you will want to do a bit of a bit of shopping. Some of the base the best um, handcraft markets are actually in Cusco, not in Cusco in the city center, but get to the markets that are down the Avenida del Sol, the, the Sun Avenue. Don't worry about this. Your local leader will be able to point out, point you in the right direction. But um, some of the best handcraft markets are found there in Cusco as well. And um, pay close attention. It's actually um, very easy to find beautiful work done by the the, um, the, the culture, the tribes, that, not the tribes, the, the, the different um Communities living up in the Andes, they all come and they sell this stuff here and in, in Cusco as well. So you can you can get your hands in real beautiful pieces of, of, of work. Really unique souvenirs, handcrafted yes. that yes. you can bring. That's so special. I love that. Um, moving on with some other questions, I've got: What is the best time of year? Do you think to go up to Machu Picchu? Whenever you can. It's a, it's a, it's the answer. Look, uh, when it comes to weather, I guess some people base the best time to travel to a destination by the weather. The rainy season in Peru is between December and um, and, and uh, between November and February, March. Those are the, that's a rainy season. During a normal rainy season, you can expect uh, storms to form in the evenings, in the afternoon, a bit of rain, and then they clear out during the day. So again, it wouldn't stop me from going and visiting Machu Picchu. It's less crowded during the rainy season. Another important factor to take into account is that in February, the Inca Trail is closed. Uh, for restoration, so February is traditionally the the quietest month in um, in, in Peru as a whole. So yes, it's a, it's the edge of the of the rainy season, but it's also particularly quiet at that time of the year. So you're gonna find fewer crowds, not only in Machu Picchu but also throughout throughout Peru. So that in terms of the weather, and then obviously on the other side of it, you've got June, July, August, and um, September. The, 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 the dry part of the year and uh, you, you're gonna have to 
you won't have to put up with the occasional um, shower, with the occasional storm. Um, it's the, the weather is far more pleasant as well. But um, but yeah, it can especially in June and July, it can get really really crowded. Our North American friends flock Peru. They come down like masses. They turn off the lights in the US and they come down to Peru. It feels like it. Um, so so yeah, perhaps July is a month that you you want to avoid if you can. So personally, if if you can, I would uh, I would say just for Machu Picchu, I would say um, uh, March, April, September, October would be my 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 pick of, of the months. But then of course, if if you want to hike the Inca Trail, do it any time of the year again. Uh, but um, avoid February because it's it's yeah. closed. That said, there are alternative tracks that you can do around the area if you can't do the, the Inca Trail itself. But you know the Inca Trail, happy to answer any questions on the Inca Trail, but um, we can spend hours again talking just about the Inca Trail and hopefully we will we'll get to it at some stage. I love it. So speaking of trekking and fitness levels, we had a question around fitness levels. So of course, there were two ways to get up to Machu Picchu. You can obviously yeah. take the bus train or you can do the trek for four days. So talk us through capabilities and fitness levels for those two options. Okay, look, um, taking the train first, uh, that's obviously the easiest, the easiest option. And you take a train and then you take a bus up to Machu Picchu. But even then, you have to think that when you are in Machu Picchu, you will spend two and a half to four hours again exploring Machu Picchu. Mm. And as you've seen, there's staircases everywhere. So you will have to climb up and down the stairs all the way through your visit to Machu Picchu. So you want to be fairly uh, agile. Um, yeah. to, to walk. You don't need to be fit. I mean, the four hours is a lot of time, and, and that's why they allowed such an ample time. So it's, it's, if, if you're a little bit slow, you can keep up with the group, and, and that's fine. But I guess um, what I'm trying to point to is that if you have any um, walking impediment, if you are in a wheelchair, if you have a um, if you have a if you can't walk much, it might be a little bit of a struggle. If you're on a wheelchair, you can still access Machu Picchu. There's a, there's a couple of entrances where you only see, um, when you get to see a few sections of Machu Picchu. So again, they've 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 um they've accommodated they've accommodated accommodated that if needed. But uh, um, but yeah, keep keep that in mind. You will need to walk up and down. So you don't need to be fit, but you need to be agile and, and be able to walk up and down. In terms of hiking, look, the Inca Trail is within the ability of most people. If you are planning, if you are planning on hiking, if you think about hiking, you are probably fairly active, and and you sh you should be fine. I was very lucky to do the Inca Trail like 15 times back in the days, and I've seen people uh, of all shapes and, and ages walk um, the Inca Trail. And you just need to be fit. You just need to be prepared uh, to to walk up to 45 kilometers in four days. So that's about. 12 right. to 15 kilometers in, in one day. So it's not huge, but it, it's definitely a challenge. Look, at the end of the trail, many many people came to me and said, oh, Martin, that's the most challenging walk that I've ever done. And But I also had people coming in and saying, you know what? That was actually quite all right, quite quite easy. But no doubt um, one of the most rewarding hikes they've ever done. Uh, yeah. Oh, has yeah when you get to the other end. Wow. Another question we have here. Oh, I love this one. Uh, it, the question reads, this has been on my must-see list for years. I want a trip which, yeah, I would trip which combines quite a lot of physical exercise and spectacular views. Does inspiring have such a tour? And we have quite a few different tours through throughout all of South America, but you are our product guru. So let us know a little bit about those. Yeah, look, we've got a few trips um, uh, already on our website. Some of them include include um, the hiking the Inca Trail, and any of those trips would uh, would again would include um, hiking hiking the the Inca Trail. And generally, look, you can be as as as, as active as you as you want in any of these itineraries. I mean, when I was touring around. Um, you know the tours don't include physical activities on every destination, but as you get to 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 Arequipa, you can rent a bike and go for a bike around the city yourself. Or when you get to um, to Lake Titicaca, you can go for a walk up to the top of a hill and view the view the sunset from the top of a mountain. And even no one else did it, but if you're up for it, if you want to be active and you enjoy that as as much as I did, you, it's, there's always those activities for you to do on, on, on a regular itinerary, really. And then, of course, you've got the, the Inca Trail. 
very active, um, beautiful sceneries, beautiful archaeological sites throughout the way. And again, if, if for any reason, they, they, the only problem with the Inca Trail is that they, it's restricted to 500 people a day, right? So you need to book those trips a fairly long time in advance not to miss out on those permits. And if you are to miss out on those permits, there are all the hikes around. I've been, again, lucky enough to do a few of them, and I can tell you they are equally impressive, equally beautiful as well, fantastic sceneries, and you also get to see Machu Picchu at the end of them. So um, so really, for that person that posted that question, my answer would be, yep, choose a trip that includes the, the Inca Trail, and then really you'll be able to be as active or not as you, as you want to on a regular itinerary. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's very good advice. Uh, oh, this is good. What are the must-eat foods or snacks yeah I, I love talking about foods from around the world so you've got to have something that you love the most sure uh, look peru is quickly becoming one of the food capitals of the world the whole uh, peruvian cuisine it's exploded you will see beautiful peruvian restaurants throughout the world uh, to, to explore the best of the peruvian cuisine you really want to go to lima lima is not my, my cup of tea. I'm not into cities. I prefer the smaller towns, the smaller, uh, you know, the, the the mountain towns. But um, but Lima, um, it's got a variety of culinary culinary options that it's it's incredible. And um, so everything on ceviche in Lima, but only in Lima, please. Ceviche is raw fish, of course, marinated with with um with lemon. Ceviche is one of the one of my favorite snacks. You can have it on, uh, you can have it pretty much anywhere you go in Lima. It's Beautiful, absolutely beautiful, but don't have it anywhere else than in Lima because fish had travel a long way through the mountains before it gets yeah. to Cusco or two other places. Um, but then, look, once in Cusco, uh, the, the Incas had an enormous amount of variety of corn and, and potatoes. So they had more than, I can't, I can't remember the exact number, but on the hundreds, hundreds of different varieties of corn and potatoes. So corn on the cob, again, a, a very, a very um, a great snack that you can pick up somewhere on the on the streets. If you are really um, <laughs> adventurous, you might want to try chicha. Chicha is a beer made out of corn. The process can be a little bit disgusting, especially if done uh, in the traditional way, which is um, chewing the corn and spitting in the pot and letting it ferment that way. But look, it's still... <laughs> I told you, you have to be adventurous. Um, but it's still, it's a drink that has been, uh, it's been made throughout the, the, throughout Peru, particularly in the Andes region, and it's, um, yeah, it's a, it's worth, worthwhile a try. Um, so yeah, I'll leave you with that. Well, I love that because I mean, you know, once in a lifetime stuff, hey, it's about the experiences. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the guinea pig, of course. Sorry, guinea pig. It's a must try. Uh, you have to try guinea pig, uh, whether you like it or not. It's it's available everywhere, so you have to. Sorry, I stopped you. No, that's absolutely fine. A couple more questions before we wrap up here, and, and right. if you are and you've got some questions, get in very quickly so we can get them answered from Martin right now. Um, but I do have one about traveling with families. Actually, yeah. is it suitable to take young children? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yes. Um, uh, I would take my family there, uh, no doubt, anytime. Um, it, the only thing you need to keep into consideration, and this is it hasn't come up in the, of the questions, but I was going to bring it up at some stage, is altitude. Look, Machu Picchu itself, it's actually not very high. It's only um, it's only two thousand four hundred meters of altitude, so you won't really experience any high altitude symptoms. However, Cusco is at 3,500 meters, and it's not super high, but it's it's uncomfortably high. So people do tend to feel the the, the, the effects of altitude there, um, from headaches to uh, dizziness to upset stomachs and, and so on. So if you if you have any pre-existing medical condition. Um, mm. We really, we really want you to visit your doctor before you visit, before you visit Machu Picchu or uh, uh, Peru, sorry, because any medication you might be on might need to be altered to to um, uh, to um, accommodate the high the high altitude. Um, again, I don't want to scare anyone around, but um, but but altitude it, it's serious. You need to think about it. You need to talk to your doctor about it. Um, unfortunately. People have passed away due to high altitude sickness um, um, illnesses in, in Cusco. 
So it's something that we take very seriously. We are very well prepared to deal with it. Our, our leaders on the ground will talk to you about it. Uh, we'll, we'll teach you what the symptoms are. We'll check on you, see how you're feeling. And if you're not feeling well, the good news is that there are very, very good medical systems in, in Cusco, especially and the, in the high altitude areas. So medical attention is always, um, is always available very quickly. We can bring a doctor to check you out at your hotel, see how you're going. Oh, you're good, it's just normal altitude sickness. Off you go. Or look, yes. we might need you to take you down to lower altitude before you before you come up again. So so yeah, something to think about, to be aware right. of, not to be aware of, but something that you need to be um, aware of. So with, with kids again, that would be my my only advice. Uh, will how will the kids um uh, cope with um with um with altitude? Um generally they cope very well. They the, the funny thing with altitude is uh, it doesn't really matter whether you are young, old, male, female, fit, and fit can affect different people differently on different times. So, um, so again, something that we need to be aware of. Don't be worried about. It. We will worry about it. We will help uh, to look after you. But you need you need to be aware of it as well. And kids, um, look, kids tend to love, especially traveling through the sacred valley, all the interactions with the local communities, with the local kids. There's a lot of soccer being played. There's a lot of volleyball being played. And the kids are the first ones to join you on those activities. And they absolutely, absolutely love it. Isn't that the best? That's so awesome. But thank you for that reminder. And of course, don't forget that on our website, we have some incredible articles on all of our destinations. There is a great one actually on there about first time to Peru. So I think that that's a definite must read when you're when you're researching and looking into your next holiday to South America. Um, coming back to food, just one more time, because this is a, yeah. this is a really great question for somebody who's traveling and yeah. they've got you know, some food restrictions, perhaps they, you know, they need to be conscious of different things, vegan, etc. How will they be managed uh, in South America? Is that is that a realistic thing for them? Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, it, it's getting better and and better uh, um, mm -hmm. nowadays. We can we can cater, we can accommodate any any dietary restriction. We just need to know beforehand. And um, there are there are a number of restaurants throughout Cusco, throughout Peru, really, and throughout South America to that extent that uh, accommodate some um, celiacs or, or different um, different uh, um, different restrictions. We just need to know about it. Even on the Inca Trail, the the chefs on the Inca Trail do an amazing job, and we can again we can accommodate any any dietary requirement there. But um, but yeah, as, as as long as we know beforehand, we can make it easy on our travelers and help them find the right place and help them find the right the right food as we go through. It doesn't hurt to bring your favorite snacks if you know if there is anything that you particularly like. Bring it with you. It might not be uh, available everywhere in Peru, but generally. And we can allocate for all different dietary restrictions. Yeah, very good, very good. Before we started our live event here today, Martin and I were having a conversation about, you know, going over to South America and how long you should take. And, you know, you you may only have three weeks and you'd like to get in and see as much as possible. And that can absolutely be accommodated. You've put together an extraordinary best of South America package, which is phenomenal. Or if you want to take your time and really delve further into the different regions, there's always the opportunity to come back again. And every region has something so very different to offer to every holiday maker, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely right. And, and that's one of the beauties of, of Peru, that it, in such a small country, it's so diverse. Right, you got a uh, you got on the you got the Amazon jungle in, in, in one end on the on the east. So you will be three or four days exploring the Amazon jungle, heat, humid, uh, and then uh, thirty minutes away on a plane, you are in Cusco, in the middle of the Andes. Again, completely different. And then you 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 go south only again thirty minutes by plane. You are in in, in Puno exploring the Lake Titicaca and that incredible community that lives floating in the Lake Titicaca year round. And then you go and explore the communities that live on the shores of Lake Titicaca. Um, and then you are in in in, in the Coca Canyon country uh, in in Arequipa again, beautiful uh, colonial building. So every part of Peru has a has different flavor, and then okay. if you move out of there, every part of um, South America really has different flavors. Um, yeah, so that's exciting. 
Oh, Martin, thank you so much for your time today and the incredible journey through Machu Picchu. I can't officially say I've been, but I can officially say I am inspired to go. So thank you so very much. Thank you, Cousin. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us and being here with us. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I um I, I enthused you to, to go there. And I hope to see you traveling to that beautiful part of the world um soon. Tremendous. Thank you, Martin. And thank you, everybody who's joined us today. Have a wonderful day. And don't forget to pop onto our website to have a little bit more of an explore of what there is to see and do in the region of Peru and, of course, further on into South America. Thank you and have a fantastic day. Bye for now.